Good afternoon. Um, I hope you all enjoyed lunch. Our next speaker is Ronnie Lempel. Uh, he's a VP uh, recommendations uh, at Outbrain, and he will be telling us about semantic challenges in content discovery services. Thank you. So. Um, the title of the talk is indeed Semantic Challenges in Content Discovery Services. And I'm here not to tell you guys about what we know how to do, but actually about what we mostly do not know how to do. But first, what is Outbrain? So I'm assuming you've all encountered this experience of coming to a publisher, to a story, uh, reading the story, and then as you scroll down, you encounter links uh, to more content, in this case, uh, more content from within this same site, uh, CNN in this case, and other links that are promoted from uh, sites that are external to the current uh, story. So this is basically what Outbrain does. It's a content discovery service that um, surfaces interesting content to users in, in the context of their browsing session or content consumption session. The Outbrain Lighthouse, or our mission statement, is to help people discover content that they trust to be interesting, relevant, and timely for them. And the challenges I'll talk about today uh, address two of these four adjectives, so trust and timely. And you'll see as I go along where are these uh, challenges and, and why they can affect the trust and timeliness of our service. Before that, uh, a few statistics on the size of the company or of, of its um, data, just to give you a sense of whatever solutions we envision or try to come up with, they have to be at the following scale. So these are some of uh, the sites we work with, our distribution partners. We reach over 550 million uh, unique users per month all over the world. We serve recommendations on 20 billion page views per month and serve 180 billion recommendations on those pages. We generate over 30 million clicks per day and need to cope with over 200, uh, over 2.5 million new content items per week. Okay, so um, it's in the realm of uh, big data and this will impose certain restrictions on, on the algorithmic machinery, okay? It has to be scalable enough to deal with um, such a service. So let's talk about the first challenge. The first challenge is about avoiding insensitive recommendations, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean by that. So while uh, we try to bring contextual recommendations to every story, sometimes uh, contextual relevance might clash with good taste. For example, here's a story, or the top of a story, about a plane crash, uh, quite a tragic plane crash. And recommendations that you can see alongside these stories, by the way, some of these recommendations were by Outbrain, some of them were by our competitors in this space. It doesn't really matter because we face these challenges whether the concrete examples I'm giving you here are ours or not. So you can see these types of recommendations next to this uh, tragic story. So stories about the world's worst airports uh, or about travel, um, adding some spice to your sex life. Now, these are contextual, and they could even be interesting. They could be relevant. But there's something here that might um, clash with readers' values, or with editors' values, the owners of the sites we, uh, our recommendations are hosted in. So this is one example of, of uh, a tragic story with some uh, stories that can seem a bit light in this context. But uh, it's more complicated than that. Take a look at this story. So this story, is it really tragic? Yes, people died, but you might say this is a story about a miracle. A plane crashing and 305 people actually walking out of this incident alive. So it's unclear whether this is tragic or not. And so when we put a recommendation such as 13 weirdest things people do on airplanes, is this now OK or not? And again, it's completely subjective. Some people might say, well, yeah, this is actually a good story about, a feel-good story about most people surviving. And so, you know, um, a 13 weirdest thing recommendation is, is fine. Some people might say, hey, two people were killed here, so tone it down. 
I'm going to give you a little bit of a quiz now. This is a story about a Formula One driver who had an accident uh, in a race and uh, was put in intensive care fighting for his life. We then got a complaint from a user, an actual user, who sent us a, a screenshot of recommendations that Outbrain served alongside this story. At first glance, uh, what do you think is the offending story here? Anyone? OK, so a lot of times what we see on stories is, is that people do not like, um, let's say, provocative images on stories about accidents. But when you actually read the complaint of the user who accompanied this uh, screenshot with some text, the thing that offended this user was that we're putting here a story about 15 athletes who died while this person is still fighting for their life in intensive care. So this is deemed to be insensitive to an athlete who is still alive, and we're already um, showcasing stories about athletes who have died. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's completely subjective, and indeed, um, it's unclear whether someone saying, I'm offended, equals the story being offensive. And actually, it probably does not. So other examples. Um, it could be considered very bad taste to put dating advice next to uh, stories about sexual crimes. And let me be clear, it's not just uh, our industry of uh, content discovery services that suffer from these issues. There is a famous Google AdSense example about um, a horrific crime of, of um, someone dying, uh, actually being murdered with their bodies uh, stashed into the trunk of a car, that car being, um, they tried to cross the Canadian-US border with it, the body was discovered, and right along that nice story, uh, there was an ad for Samsonite, the luggage uh, company. So of course here, um, actually it would be Samsonite who would object to their brand being associated with uh, stuffing bodies into suitcases. Um, and so you really have to understand sometimes that there are stories or uh, content or ads who should not be promoted in the context of, of other stories. Um, now, let, let me state that, again, this is subjective. So I can almost state an axiom that for any potential recommendation on any story, there will exist a user who will find that recommendation to be offensive in that story. Okay, so people find many things offensive that most of us would not seem, um, would not find offensive. But here's their hope. So um, what we need here from this community is advancements in uh, mood detection, tone detection, and refinements of sentiment analysis. Something that can distinguish between somber, sad, tragic, and maybe bad, but could have been much worse type of stories. Um, crimes, and you know, there are things that you could, you can't put light recommendations alongside crime stories, but you need to put, you, you should not put the, the wrong type of recommendations. So, you know, you can put 13 weirdest things people do on airplanes next to a sexual crime story. You should not put dating advice next to that story, okay? Because if it's a light story in a totally different context, it's deemed not offensive. But if it's a light story in the same context, it is deemed offensive. So um, we need to understand more about how to match recommendations that in certain contexts offend uh, many readers or many uh, editors. And again, whether, whether being offended is justified or not, this is something that erodes trust. A user who is offended will automatically um, diminish their trust of these recommendations as being a good conduit to more content or, or to browsing in general. Challenge number two I want to talk to you about today is the issue of ephemeral content versus evergreen content. So what do I mean by that? The prototypical ephemeral content or content that has a very short shelf life is news. And we all know about uh, the typical life cycle of a piece of news. It very rapidly moves from being breaking news 
to being in mainstream consumption, something that you might find on you know, the most popular stories. And then interest in it sort of decays as either it becomes less relevant or more people have already encountered it, whether on this site or on other sites, or through TV or radio or word of mouth. And not, not too long after it became breaking news, maybe within 24 to 36 hours, it becomes an archival story that you can basically wrap fish in. And um, the only users who will visit this story uh, in the future, most likely they came from a search they, get, they did on some, on some uh, query, and this story happened to come up as a result in a search engine. So these are uh, ephemeral pieces of content. Sometimes their relevance actually terminates at a single point as if it fell off a cliff. So for example, uh, the final polls before an election are completely irrelevant a minute after the first exit poll of the actual true results. The predictions about uh, what a hurricane might do and whether people need to evacuate and you know what we he see here about uh, the hurricane uh, over the next three days, that loses all relevance the minute the hurricane actually hits and we see its actual effect. Any speculation about the top uh, three um, finalists who, who will reach the uh, final of American Idol? It stops being interesting the second we know who those three contestants are. Okay, so even with news, we can have stories that have a slow decay and stories that have very abrupt decays and stop being timely. On the other hand, we have evergreen content. We have content that you can show basically um, 365 days a year. For example, 14 reasons you're always tired. Um, and we find a lot of perpetually evergreen content in categories such as lifestyle, health and fitness, home improvements, and gardening, and parenting, and uh, travel, and so forth. However, it is important to note that not all stories in these categories are perpetual evergreen. They do have ephemeral content. So even though the category of the story does provide a prior, you cannot just say, well, this is from a relationship category, and so it must be evergreen. That's not the case. Even with evergreen content, there are many types of evergreen content. So these were the perpetually evergreen content uh, stories. There's also seasonal evergreen stories. Um, and even here, we have a subclassification into short season content. For example, Halloween recipes that are relevant every year, but only for a couple of weeks before Halloween, or um, the 10 worst Super Bowl halftime shows or any other Super Bowl statistic that would be relevant a couple of weeks before the Super Bowl. Content on the Oscars or the Emmys or the Grammys or whatever other award show you might be interested in. Event anniversaries such as um, you know 100 years to World War One or um, the passing of famous people, these would all be short season uh, evergreen. We also have long season evergreen, so seasonal getaways. Uh, ski trip information is usually pumped for about three to four months in winter. Here we have a, uh, a getaway to a particular safari. Tax return tips from, let's say, mid-February to mid-April in the US. And then we also have evergreen content that comes in multi-year cycles. So stories about the Olympics, World Cups, elections. These are things that uh, span multiple years. And a story might be evergreen, but dormant for four years in between its peaks. We also have event-driven evergreen content. So again, this is not perpetually evergreen. But it's not also, it's not tied to a particular cycle or period. It just happens that um, certain pieces of content are evergreen in certain, after certain events. So for example, everybody likes royal weddings. We don't have them often enough. But when a royal uh, wedding happens, there are a bunch of stories that suddenly become relevant again or timely again. Natural phenomena like uh, comet flybys, volcano eruptions, natural disasters such as floods and storms and earthquakes and droughts, accidents or incidents from airline crashes to um, gun violence to uh, border clashes. 
So we really can't predict when these will happen. But once a story on one of these uh, events happens, there is a bunch of evergreen content that can be recommended alongside it. Uh, for example, what to do when tornadoes strike, or what time do they strike, and you know, retrospect on the worst uh, airline disasters in American history. OK, so if we try to classify uh, content longevity patterns, what can we use? So obviously, we can use NLP, OK? Uh, after all, this is, this is why I'm presenting this here. Um, so sometimes the title is a giveaway. Very shallow um, features like you know, a number of best or worst, or any title that starts with a number, is already quite an informative indicator of some type of evergreen content. Identifications of nearby or future past, uh, nearby future or past dates. So a story that mentions yesterday, or tonight, or in three days, or next month, is probably a story that uh, will not be evergreen. Um, if we can identify news tone versus editorial tone, news tone probably associated with ephemeral content. Editorial tone might be evergreen. And as I said earlier, uh, content category certainly supplies a very significant prior to the question of whether uh, a story or a piece of uh, content is ephemeral or evergreen. What about behavioral signals? So for example, do site editors promote this piece of content to their home pages once or more than once? Most news articles will be promoted once to the home page of a, of a news site or, a, or a, you know, a content site. However, when we see pieces of content that are surfaced every so often by editors of a site, that's a pretty good indication that they deem it to be evergreen, and they typically are right. They know what they're doing. What about um, users? Do we see, we can also observe patterns of audience engagement with this piece of content and see whether, for example, click-through rates deteriorate or fluctuate, go up and down. Maybe we find uh, period, periodicity in it. Um, you can think about time series analysis that goes into there. And uh, from practical point of view, any precise classification of ephemeral versus evergreen content is very likely to uh, require both NLP and uh, behavioral signals. So to conclude, uh, I showed you uh, just a small sample of several NLP-related challenges we have in, in the content discovery business. I talked about avoiding insensitive recommendations, where basically it's a place where ambiguity and semantics meets uh, the subjective values of editors of sites and readers, web users. I talked about ephemeral versus evergreen content, where NLP combined with editors and readers' behavior is likely to be the key to a proper classification. We are uh, open and actually enthusiastic about collaboration with academia on any of these, so uh, feel free to talk to us about this. Uh, we are open to not only investigating this together, but also uh, sharing data on these problems and more. And uh, thank you. Happy to take any questions.